So today is Super Bowl uh, Sunday, but there's no greater gathering than, uh, than gathering to partake of the Lord's Supper, to gather to worship the Lord. I'm told that uh, today that you too can have a commercial during the Super Bowl, um, 30 seconds, if you have $70 million. Uh, so our, our communication team, our staff, finance team, we decided that's not a good use of our funds. Um, <laughs> I don't know who you've got today, but uh, maybe the, the over-under is more, how many times are you going to see Taylor Swift, right? How's, what's that, well, how many times is that going to happen? There's a, greater, uh, there's a greater game going on, as I noted. There's a much bigger gathering that's taking place. Millions of people around the world who have responded to the grace of God are gathering for worship all day long around the globe because his grace continues to change lives amen but somebody evidently these companies think that they can convince us to buy their stuff there's been a lot of money to convince us because we like stuff i mean if we're honest we like new stuff some of you like new clothes you like new car you want a new new technology a new gadget we like new things but like we talked about last week we were talking about order how God brings order and his reign and rule over our lives, we have a kind of a love-hate relationship with new because new means change. And change uh, means grief because we're giving up something. We're letting go of something in order to grab hold of the new. Here's a riddle for you. What is new that never grows old? Because that's the problem with new. New gets old, right? And what we've seen throughout this series of messages, and if you're a guest or new here today, we've been walking through the promises of God, the covenants that he has made with his people, with us, his people, long lineage of people who by faith have come into relationship with him. But today we're going to look at the answer to that question. What, what is it that is new that never gets old. And you'll find it in Jeremiah 31. If you'll turn there, Jeremiah 31, the text that we have read together, Rebecca read, uh, you read, we read it this week, in fact. Uh, on Friday, we read it as our dwell reading. I trust that you have a journal. If you don't have one, you can grab one today. A guest, dive in. You can also find it online. But we're reading every day, all of us. You don't have to be a member of our church to join us. All of our members, all of our Leaders all the way down are reading daily. You even have a place here you can take notes. Um, so bring your journal, even to uh, Sunday mornings. Take notes uh, on sermons there. You can see that Saturday's a day that guides us. We've been praying for schools this month. We have a prayer focus every month. We're diligent to be in God's word. So today we're going to... Um, we're going to look at the answer to that question. Now, to place this in context, as we always do, it's about 600 BC. Jeremiah was a prophet who was uh, calling out, preaching to the people of Israel, Jerusalem primarily, to is Israel, to say, turn back to God or there will be consequences. This is how the Lord works in our lives, isn't it? It's how we parent our children, but it's really how we learn anything. You could say natural, supernatural consequences that come to us. When we don't follow the way of God, we don't follow his truth, then we pay consequences for it. So a prophet is not as much, you know, future telling. That's a, a kind of a, a apocalyptic literature we see in, in Revelation, some in Daniel, other places. But this is future oriented in that if you do this, this will happen. Jeremiah is called out in Jeremiah 7, verse 27. The Lord calls Jeremiah out and he says, I'm going to tell you what to say. You're going to preach this and you're going to say this, but the people will not listen to you. And you're going to keep preaching and no one's going to listen to you. Now you can imagine, I've thought about that often. This is true for all of us, but as a preacher, pastor, Jeff, you go and you preach and you, you say what I want you to say. Nobody is going to turn. Nobody's going to listen to you. Jeremiah does this for 40 years. He, he doesn't have one convert, as far as we know. No wonder he's called the weeping prophet, right? Now, he's the weeping prophet because he watches the destruction of Jerusalem. In 586, as the Babylonians come, just as he said they would, they destroy the temple, Solomon's temple, 
that we talked about last week, the Davidic covenant, the temple's destroyed. And he watches Jerusalem in rubbles. In, in rubble. He, he, he writes then the, thus the book of, Revelation, uh, of Lamentations. He laments what he sees and he knew that it was coming. Many of us know just a couple of uh, chapters before a verse that we love. You have it cross-stitched. You know, we memorize uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to give you a future and hope. But we take that out of context and forget that was actually written to a people in exile. Daniel's a contemporary. He was sent out, one of the first to be deported with his friends. Jeremiah is one of the last of the deportations. He's sent off into exile himself. He ends up in Egypt, and we don't hear from him again. Except that I'm talking about him today. Such is the nature of the kingdom of God. His persevering spirit, his faithfulness to God. This is a good word before we get to the text. Faithfulness and obedience to God is success. Full stop. Oh, but yeah, but what about the, you know, if I'm faithful, then this will happen. Or if I, if I do that, then, not unlike the anthem we just heard. Lord, I, I worship you because of who you are. You are my eternal king, my eternal God. I'm responding to your grace and I'm going to be obedient regardless of what happens. Someone needs to hear that in, in some area of your life today. But what we see here with the life of Jeremiah, we saw it in all of the covenants. Each one points to something else. How is it that God is holding true to his covenantal promise when Jerusalem, all Israel, has been dispersed, been destroyed? Well, we find the answer in this passage. Because what we need, first of all, we need a new covenant. That's what we need. He says, behold, in verse 31, look, wake up, listen up. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with my house of Israel and of the house of Judah, not like, watch this, the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand. Look at this language. Taking them, I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. They hardly felt like he was just bringing them by the hand like a child walking with a father. They're called out of Egypt. The great exodus, my covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, declares the Lord. There's a lot that's being said here. We started this series by talking about a eucatastrophe. It's a word that J.R. Tolkien made up. Uh, you, E-U, means good in the Greek. A good catastrophe. In Genesis 3, we see the Adamic covenant where uh, we see the fall, the worst moment in all of history. And then right there, there's, there's this turning, there's a spin, and the Lord says, out of the seed of the woman will come another, and, and, and he will crush the head of the serpent. We're going, what is this about? And if you're tracking the story, you don't know much about it, it seems kind of fuzzy. And then Noah, after the flood, he sees a rainbow, he sees a bow in the sky. And we said that the bow, of course, is, is actually pointing upward, it's not pointing downward. The wrath of God is not coming to to us. Instead, he points it upward to himself, you could say. What is happening here? Each covenant continues to point us to something else. It's still a bit fuzzy, but almost like vectors when, we, when we're trying to land a, a plane, we start to get clearer and clearer. We get closer and closer, and we start to see what's happening. Abraham shows up, the Abrahamic covenant. He says, out of you, I'm going to make a great nation. Abraham says, where am I going? I'll show you. I'm going to bring you to a land, bring you uh, to a, a people, and you're going to be a great nation. And then the Mosaic covenant comes. The exodus takes place, and, and God enters into this covenant with his people. A lot of language around, around a wedding and marriage and a covenant that he has with his people and a radical call to holiness in their lives. But it was always determined by fidelity to the covenant, to the law. 
And, and if they didn't keep the law, then there would be consequences to come. Then the Davidic covenant, we looked at last week with greater clarity. There's a king that's coming and he's going to reign forever. Because see, each time the people were unable to keep their side of the covenant, if you will. But we noted there's a difference, again, between a contract and a covenant. A contract says, I'm in if you're in. You don't keep up your side of this thing, I'm out. And that's how we live our lives. That's why we have so many, sorry, attorneys in our church. I mean, we just, we got to litigate this stuff because we don't keep our promises. We see that on the spiritual level as well. We said that a covenant is different. God's covenant say, I'm in whether you're in or not. I am in. So it brings this tension. Wait, don't we have a part in this? And wait, you're saying that if we, we don't keep our side, he's faithful? How does that happen? Each story ends with us wondering, how is this going to happen? Of course, if you know the grander story, the great catastrophe is the Christ event. He comes to us in the person of Jesus. He lives the perfect life for us. He dies on the cross. He, he keeps the commandments and he's raised again and the resurrection confirms and solidifies the new covenant that we're looking at here today. But notice back to the text, verse 32, he's talking specifically. He says, it's not like the old covenant. There's a new covenant. How is it not like the old covenant? Well, notice specifically, which covenant is he talking about here? Can you discern? Do you see it? He's talking about the Mosaic covenant, right? Which is really that moment where there is this commitment, a covenantal commitment between God and his people. And he says, and they broke it. Literally, he says. And then they break this marriage covenant. Look, and then he goes on to use this language, right? I was their husband. They were unfaithful. So the prophets then throughout the Old Testament talk about our sin as spiritual adultery. We've turned away from him. And then Hosea, some of you know his story. A prophet shows up and God says, essentially, I want your life and your marriage to be your message. Hosea says, what? I want you to remain faithful to an unfaithful woman and an unfaithful, an unfaithful spouse. Because that will be the message. Because that is what's happening here. I am faithful. My people are not. And not much has changed. Or I should say, in regard to us, much has changed to what he has done. It's why you're here today. It's why we praise the Lord. It's why all of life is a response to what he has done for us. But the problem is that many people still, we tend to go back. I think it was Martin Luther. He said, the, the law is the de default mode of the human heart. I don't know how that translated default mode from German uh, in the 1500s. But he, he said, it's where we always run. And he's right, because we turn our relationship with God into a contract. And I want you to think about your own life. I'm prone to do this. We're all prone to do this. I, Lord, I, I did this and you didn't come through for me. Uh, you've been challenged to, to go above and beyond the, the giving. Our, our members have been recently. And Lord, I've given a lot, but I'm not getting a lot back. Which is really a prosperity gospel, right? It's a law of reciprocity. And if we're not careful, we do this even in our prayer lives. Lord, I've been praying. Now I don't think you've answered my prayers. I'm out. It's why many of us don't pray as we should. Because we've forgotten God is going to come through. We're seeing this in our culture today. There's much that's being written and talked about in terms of the ex-evangelicals. And, and you've heard the stories of those who are now the nuns over the past 20, 30 years, leaving the church, some leaving the faith. Can I just say it? You don't leave the faith. We talk about once saved, always saved, which is true theologically. Once you're saved, always saved. We, we have also noted, maybe we need to stop saying that because a lot of times we think, well, I did this, so I'm saved. I walked the aisle, I'm saved. I got baptized, I'm saved. I said a prayer, I'm saved. And then we wonder, how is it that people are leaving the faith and deconstructing their faith all the way out to no faith? What we need to say, I think, is once you're saved, yes, 
by faith, the grace of God you receive by faith, your perseverance, your obedience and your passion for the Lord, though yes, it can wane, but you are on an upward trend and trajectory towards him. Your perseverance proves that you're saved. That's what scripture teaches us. And so are you pursuing him in your life? Are you all in? Are you reading his word? And I know I'm preaching to the proverbial choir in some way today because you're here. You're saying, yes, it's why I'm here. I want to hear a word from the Lord. I'm pursuing him. Continue to do so, friends. But what the writer of Hebrews tells us, about 65 AD, after the Jewish system of sacrifices had been in place for so many years, the writer says this, in speaking of a new covenant, He makes the first one obsolete and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. He says it's disappearing. Five years later, 70 AD, Jerusalem is taken down again, this time by the Romans. The temple having been rebuilt, then Herod comes in to really rebuild the temple is destroyed, even as Jesus said it would. Why? The once and for all sacrifice has come in Christ. The sacrificial system is no longer needed. Why? There's a new covenant that has come. We need a new covenant. But why can't we keep the covenant? Here it is. Because we need a new heart. The first part of verse 33. This is so important to understand, friends. We say it often. Sin is not simply bad behavior up against good behavior. Sin is a condition of the heart. And we cannot rescue ourselves. We can't be good enough. We need a heart transplant is what we need. Look at verse 33. For this is the covenant that I make, I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law, look at this, within them. And I will write it on their hearts. We talked about this last week, this house of Israel. It's, it's, it's like the Davidic covenant. It's, it's the lineage, right? It's a house. Like we talk about the house of Windsor, a lineage of royalty. Though not bloodline necessarily. I think they're most Germanic, the British hierarchy or royalty there. But what we see here is not just a bloodline anymore. It's no longer that. In fact, Jesus would confront the Pharisees who really did did kind of bow up and, you know, say, hey, we're, we're, we're children of Abraham, meaning we are in. And Jesus confronted them and said, no, 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 no. Don't claim Abraham as your father. If you do not have faith, and ultimately he'll say, in me, you are not children of Abraham because now those who are children of Abraham are just as he was people of faith. Faith in what? Jesus says you look throughout the scriptures believing that in them you find eternal life. But he says the scriptures are pointing to me. All of the covenants were pointing to Jesus. And then Paul comes along Read the book of Romans, right? Read his epistles where he says it's no longer through the law. And he says in Romans, of course, those who who live by faith are those who are reckoned as righteous. And he says, Abraham, he says it was always by faith. Abraham was reckoned as righteous because of his faith. And now fully known, fully seen in Christ, our faith is focused on the person of Jesus The exact location of our faith and trust is in the person of Jesus. The prophet Ezekiel, who was a contemporary of Jeremiah's, by the way, said it this way. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. Then he says this, and I will give you a new heart. This is what we need. A new spirit. Look at this. A new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules, to obey all of my commands. We need a new heart. Think about it. 
with Abraham, Moses, David, as devoted as they were at times, they never experienced a new heart. This is a new covenant altogether. Abraham could point to the stars and say, someday it's going to happen. Or Moses could cry out to the people, please, obey, obey. And even himself, all of these heroes of the Old Testament are faithful in a moment and then wheels off. And he shows up and God essentially says, there's the promised land. Yeah, you're not going. You're not going to make it. And we go, what happened? How is this going to resolve itself? David shows up and as faithful as he is. During the golden years of Israel's history, he ends up committing adultery and then murder, essentially. And as we looked at last week, his family disintegrates before our eyes. What's going on here? And why does God continue to use flawed and broken people to do his bidding? Because that's all he's got. And that's good news for us today. You're hearing it. You're seeing it. Moses was not the hero. Abraham wasn't the hero. David's not the hero. God is the hero. God is the hero of the Bible. See, see, many of us are are waiting to get our act together. Then we'll serve the Lord. Maybe some of us were trying to get our financial house in order. Then I'm really going to be a giver. No, no, you won't. Not if you're not giving now. I talk to many young families or couples and man, you know, people, you probably have heard this, probably thought it. When I'm making a bunch of money someday, I'm going to be so generous. I'm, gonna, I'm trying to make as much money as possible. I'll give it away. Some of you live that way, for real. I mean, some of you who have great means, you give generously. But I would argue, no, if you're not giving now, you're not going to do that. It's only, it'll only get harder. You're not, no. We, we're waiting. I, I know I need to get in a connect group. Is what I hear how amazing it is. I think I need to do life with other believers. I'm going to do that. But I just got, I got a few barriers standing in the way. I'm a little, little, little fearful. Don't know exactly what that's going to be like. We're waiting. Waiting till everything is in line, waiting to get our act together, waiting to muster up enough strength. This is a word for someone today. You've already heard that we need, you know, workers for VBS, or you could serve our students. You could serve in some ministry here. Well, I, you know, I, I know I didn't, I didn't go to seminary. I don't really know if I have all the answers. What if a four-year-old asked me a question I don't know the answer to? See, my point is this, some of us are waiting We're waiting on God. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on you. How would you apply that in your life today? See, the gospel changes our hearts. And as we serve one another, as we dive in, as we're faithful, God shows up in ways that he, we don't see otherwise. But but I want you to see that it's no longer this literal bloodline. It's now a line of faith. It's faith in Christ. I could say it's the bloodline of Jesus. His blood shed for us and he infuses us with the power of his Holy Spirit with a new heart. Don't miss this. And the ability now to live just like Jesus. Jesus in the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be diving deeply into it in the fall and I cannot wait. But there he says, this is how you live. And some people think, well, that's, that's kind of like the new law. Nobody can live that way. No, Jesus is saying, no, my, my followers live exactly like this. And we can do so because of the power of the Spirit in us. We need a new covenant. We need a new heart. And finally, we need a new relationship. And he brings it to us. And I will be their God. Listen to this. And they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother. What's going on here? Saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest. It's another way of saying, 
everybody, doesn't matter, all are included, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. All people will be included by faith. We've talked about this. The greatest inclusive exclusivity known to man. Everybody's welcome, but there's only one way. And it's through Christ. Jesus becomes, don't miss this, the perfect Israelite. He fulfills the law, the very heart of the law. He obeys God's commands perfectly. He's the perfect Israelite who lives out the commands of God for us. We say this all the time. He's our substitute before he's our example. And now the church, watch this, becomes the new Israel who enter in by faith, not by works. See, many Christians, even today, believe that somehow some are going to get in apart from faith in Christ. You end up with two covenants. Jesus says, I've come to replace the old covenant. The new covenant comes only through him because we've proven we cannot keep the old covenant. And again, we've seen it, 586 B.C., uh, the, the, the temple's destroyed. It's rebuilt. And then the second temple's destroyed in 70 AD, just after Christ comes. And what we see here is that Jesus, you see, is the new Adam. That's what Paul calls him. He's the better Noah. He's not coming just to rescue his family. He's, he's coming to draw the entire world around him and the sacrifice made. He's taken upon himself the wrath of God. He's the perfect Israelite who keeps the Mosaic law. He is the one who brings the new covenant, gives us a new heart, and he gives us a new relationship. And look at the nature of this relationship. In verse 33, there's a mutual claim. This is a good word, this Valentine's week. He says, you're going to be mine. You're mine. Notice he says, you're my people. I am your God. You know, when I refer to my sweet wife, Stacy, I don't say the wife. My kid, the kids. The mom. <laughs> the dad. The, no, my wife. There's this claim of possession and that's what God's doing here. And can I say it? You're my brothers and sisters. We belong to each other. This is my church family. God is our God because of what Christ has done for us. And look at this. The relation speaks of mutual knowledge as well. Here's what's going on there. There's direct knowledge is what he's saying. We can know him. We, we don't need a priest. Christ the high priest has come. Now there's direct knowledge and we know his word. We have his word. We can hear directly from him and by his spirit and yes, from each other. We need one another, not simply because of our amazing teachers and our connect groups, but because there are times in ministry that you're going to need help from me. I'm going to need help from you. There are times when you're going to need to forgive me. I'm going to need to forgive you. You see, that's how we work. That's how we grow. It's grace in action. It's being like Jesus. And the best place to do it is right here. This incubator called the church. And if you're not a member, today is your day to join the fellowship of our church. There's this knowledge that comes as we do this together. And then finally, this third component is forgiveness. You see that? I often say in, in weddings, marriage is the union of two good forgivers. God is the forgiver He's the initiator. So the old covenant has been replaced by the new. And Jesus, the new and perfect Israelite, invites us into the new Israel, the new family of God. So that the writer of Hebrews says this in, in verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 22. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. In Galatians, Paul puts it this way. Understand then, that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles. Any Gentiles in here? That would be all of us, yes. By faith. 
and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. But now watch this. The land is not simply a little plot of land just east of the Mediterranean. The land is the whole wide world and the new earth to come. It's why Habakkuk 2.14 says, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This gospel goes forth. The great commission sends us to the whole wide world because every heart belongs to him as they hear the gospel message and everyone is included. Praise be to God. The vertical invasion of Jesus into our world and into our lives has brought about the new covenant with new hearts and a new relationship with him. And so as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, I want us to now just turn our hearts directly towards the Lord's Supper as we partake together. And we're going to sing our way out when we finish our time together. But right now, I want you to just, if you just bow your heads and close your eyes right now. How is the Lord speaking into your heart? My hope here today has been that we put an exclamation point. It's what Jesus has done for us. All of these covenants point to him. Because he has fulfilled it all. He has done it all. And he did it specifically through his blood shed on the cross, his body broken for us, the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God, who's made a way. And we have the privilege today of coming to the table. We have one table. We have one meal that unites us all. Lord, we give our hearts to you now to say thank you. Again, dying to ourselves to worship you with all we are. In your name we pray. Amen.